want to start off by saying welcome to the breakdown, the do's and don'ts of location management. My name is Sally Haslam. I'm the film production specialist here at the Utah Film Commission, and I'm going to go ahead and turn the time over to Derek. Thank you, Sally. Um, hello, I want to thank you all for taking the time to join us for the webinar today. Um, I'll briefly introduce myself. Uh, my name is Derek Mellis, and I'm the production manager for the Utah Film Commission. For those of you who may not be aware of what the Film Commission is or does, uh, we are a state division under the Governor's Office of Economic Opportunity, and we market the state of Utah as a filming destination by promoting the use of its locations, crew, and cast, uh, and support services uh, for, um, for commercial TV and film production. My specific role is to work with inquiring productions and assist them with finding resources in the state answer any logistical questions they may have about filming here and ultimately make them feel comfortable enough to film their production in Utah. Uh, prior to the working for the UFC, I worked in uh, the film and TV industry, uh, coming up in the art and construction departments, and then eventually finding a role in the locations department. Uh, but enough about me. We are thrilled to have our two panelists joining us here today. They come to us with a broad range of experience in the locations department. Um, while Andy works mostly in film and TV and does commercials as well, Samantha focuses more on commercial and larger still campaigns, and it also produces. Um, I'll let them each introduce themselves, um, and maybe uh, can we start with you, Andy? Uh, sure. I, I'm Andy Langton. I've been working in film and TV and commercials for 30 years now. Ugh. I am I, I'm I'm close to being done, but uh, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Awesome. And Samantha, Samantha Mitchell. Uh, hi everybody. I'm Samantha Mitchell. So I moved to Utah ten years ago. Before that, I was working in the still photography industry in New York. Uh, I grew up on the East Coast in New Jersey, so I was there for ten years before coming here. So I've been in the industry not as a location manager, but generally in different aspects of production since 2005. So not quite as long as Andy, but you know, getting, getting there. <laughs> That's great. Um, well, you know, judging by our audience, I, um, you know, one of the questions that came up in the, as people are registering is they're all curious about what your career path was and how did you get to where you are today uh, in, in locations? How did you fall into locations? I, uh, I got hired by Dino De Laurentiis to drive a location manager around. And he taught me how to type up letters, which we were using typewriters back then, and how to propose locations um, as options for uh, property owners and for the director. And it was Michael Cimino and he was very challenging and we did whatever we could do to satisfy the situation. Back, to, back then, Andy, were you like physically printing photos and then taping them together oh, for location? Yeah, we, yeah we, we, were, we were printing photos. I mean, the, the best part about printing photos is that you could drop off six rolls of film that would need to be printed in like 40 minutes and that was your lunch break <laughs> so uh, there's no digital so I, I and the other thing is i took michael chimino to evanston wyoming and we got to evanston and the production designer myself and the location manager we all jumped out of the car and went to a pay phone with quarters to make phone calls back to Salt Lake City. So that was how long ago that was. <laughs> That's great. Samantha, how about you? How did, how did you fall into this and see your current role in your career path? Sure, I, um, so I went to school for photography back East and graduated, moved into New York City, kind of took whatever I could in the film photo industry and started working for a production company that specialized in stock photography actually. And in that role, I was a producer and an art director. And so I learned kind of all aspects of putting a shoot together, production, art direction, um, styling sometimes we would do, a lot of location scouting. So I kind of did everything. And then when I moved to Utah, 
10 years ago, I decided I didn't want to work for anybody but myself. So I started freelancing and working production for still shoots. And then location management specialty kind of came a few years in where I started marketing myself for that as well, because I just mm -hmm. found myself loving that just as much as production. So, um, so yeah, so then, so basically what happens out here is I get hired um, as a producer for stills or as a location scout and manager for stills, video and for TV commercial shoots. So I'm kind of a few different things. You know, for the, you know, some of those tuning in that may not be a, you know, familiar with what it is that a location manager or scout does. Um, maybe you could take just a minute, each of you to kind of talk about what, what is that role? You know, I mean, um, when do you come on to the production? For instance, how long do you stay on the production? What is, yeah. Andy, do you want to start? You want to? Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, we come on pretty early. Uh, they give us a script and we have to break it down and we have to go out and find options for them. Uh, and, then, <laughs> and then they give us thumbs up or thumbs down. But when we get a thumbs up, then we have to secure it and then we have to permit it. So it's, it's a process, but we generally start pretty early on. Yeah, and I, I, I think, you know, a lot of people don't realize all of the logistics that are behind when you say secure it, uh, because you're, you're also finding all the, all the parking for the crew and, and for, uh, you know, the base camp support vehicles. Well, I think that was the one thing that I wanted to bring up is it's about communication. You're communicating with the homeowner or the property owner, but you also have to communicate with everybody who's in that radius. So that if, if it's permitting or if it's the neighbors or if it's the neighboring businesses, that was the one thing I was gonna try to bring up today. It's just, it's, it's not just getting the deal done, it's spreading yourself out through the neighborhood. Right, and and Samantha, when you when you're working on a commercial or or a larger still shoot, and and maybe even wearing those two hats as the producer and the location manager, uh, would you say that's true? That you know, it's, it is about communication. Oh, 100 percent. I mean, that's the most important thing. You have to make sure that you're conveying, you know, what the impact is going to be on the location if it's a private home or something like that. Especially people who haven't done this before. With commercials, it can be, um, and, and even Andy can speak to this in terms of movies and, and series, it's a huge impact on their life for that day or two days or however long it will be there. And the neighborhood as well. So holding parking and um, that can be a thing with, with neighbors for sure. I was actually just scouting right before this call for the, the job that I have coming up. And my first thought is, wow, there's a lot of people parked on the street here. This could be a thing, you know, so so that's just something you have to be really communicative with neighbors and hold parking for just the designated time that you need it. And I try, I don't like to hold, me personally, hold more than I need um, for that reason, because I like to keep people happy. But uh, yeah, communication is is 100% huge. And, you know, in terms of uh, when we start, I mean, as Andy said, we start right away. If you're starting out in the business, you may not have a file you know, files of locations that you can provide to a client. Typically when I start, I'll usually send them uh, a file poll to start. Hey, what do you like here? I'll pull locations from the film commission as well. And that'll give us a good kind of base to start from and then go from there. Um, so- I'm very and, happy you mentioned the location library yeah, on the- but It's true, it's super, it's extensive and helpful and it's a really good supplement for anything that we might not have. Um, I've been here 10 years, so I have quite a lot of files. I'm sure, Andy, you have even twice as much as I do, and it's really helpful to kind of start out that way um, and then hit the, hit the ground running scouting. Right. Yeah, I, I think the thing that I've found is that as much as I have file photos, it's always so specific that they're looking for that I have to go shoot it again. And it's like, I, right. like I've like i got file photos, but you're looking for that tree with the branch. I don't have that. I've got to go shoot that. That's hilarious. Um, 
you know, I know there are a lot of smaller productions, short student films, you know, that maybe can't afford a location manager, but, you know, what would you say is most beneficial about having a look, hiring a location manager for a production? Um, you know, and maybe we'll start with you, Samantha, since you do both produce. Yeah. Them. I mean, you know, I, I find this even from the production side of things, sometimes with the smaller photography shoots that I do, the photographer has has uh, traditionally, or they, this person has taken on both roles, production and photography. And it's the same answer I would have with a larger production as far as locations. It's just one last thing that the producer has to do or some other person has to do. It's just all, I mean, on commercials, you absolutely need a location manager and a scout to kind of keep that separate. It's just, it's a lot of work and it's extremely time consuming. So when I'm on a commercial, I'm pretty much working until that commercial shot. So to have someone else have to take care of that, it's, it's, I don't think it's worth, it's worth saving the money on. That would be my personal thought on that. Well, I, I would absolutely agree. I mean, I think we're problem solvers and I think we try and get ahead of the production to the point that we've got the permitting process, we've got police, we've got everything. So we're, so we're trying to be, I, I always say I wanna be three days ahead. Is that enough? I don't know, but I wanna be three days ahead of production, whatever the, the case may be. And that just solves problems before they show up. No, that's a, that's a really good point. And I would um, also, oh, sorry, Derek, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I would just also add that having an experienced location scout manager is gonna help you get around some things that you may not know. If you're coming into a location you've never shot in before, you may not realize there's certain things that you needed or that you can't do. Um, for example, I'm just throwing this out there. If you've never shot in a national park and you're coming in green, you may not know you can't bring your drone or you can't bring your UTV that's your camera car. You know, it's, it's, these are things that as Andy was saying, staying ahead of the game, we know because we've been doing this long enough that when we can see problems ahead of time and, and kind of nip them in the bud before they become a problem on set, which is obviously never something you want. Very true. Um, you know, there's a, a long time location manager now had told me at one point in time, and I, this always stuck with me is that, you know, as a location manager, you work 51% is what he would say. Uh, for the location and 49% for the production, even though the production, you know, obviously paying you. Would you guys agree with that statement? Andy, I'll let you take this one <laughs> to start. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, Derek. I'm 99% for the location. I'm 1% for production. But if we get a good location and we do it right, everything goes smooth and then, and there's no there's no issues there but it's but it's really trying to take care of the location that we can come back to we can do it again i, I just did six different days on the same street over two months wow they still like me <laughs> <laughs> that's great yeah, I mean, uh, I, I think it is important. It, it speaks to uh, kind of sustainability in filmmaking uh, that that you, you are taking care of the location first, you know, because, you know, um, Samantha, you probably agree with me that here is, you know, that that's the most, that's your baby. You know, that's what you're going to come back to, um, you know, where you may never work for that production again, right? Exactly. Okay. You know, Andy and I live here and work here and, um, you know, most of my location work is here in Utah. So if a client, and, and we've talked about this too, clients are usually, they listen and they're usually pretty good. But if anybody's, you know, asking for something that's going to cause an issue or not respecting the place, I mean, for us, the priority is keeping our home turf um, viable to continue working. And so it is, it's, it's absolutely more important that the location is taken care of um, and sometimes, yeah. you know, so because we have to keep coming back and we, and like Andy said, that's amazing. If you're going back to a street and shooting, cause taking over a street is, a, it can be very, um, invasive to, to people. And so if you're welcome back time and time again, that's, that's not even great for him. It's great for me and great for everybody else. I, I did a fist bump today with our primary homeowner and 
he was really concerned about the neighbors and just getting a fist bump from him today. <laughs> we're done. Thank you. Everybody's good. It was, it was great. That's great. Um, I, I'd like to get back into talking about the, you know, your specific role and, and maybe in part of your process. Um, could you tell us, um, you know, what makes a location the right fit for a production? I mean, how do you, um, how do you approach finding locations? Well, Andy, you want to? I mean, is there are there places that? <laughs> so, and maybe I, so I work for I work for too. Clay Ma. Okay. And Clay is a great location manager. His feeling is always, let's make it as easy as possible for our department to take this location. Let's make sure we've got a Wheeler Farm parking lot or we've got parking over here. So I'm not that same way, but I, but I do respect the fact that he understands logistics, logistics are a yeah. big part of the, of the situation. And to speak more to that, so it's you know that getting ahead of it because you can find the perfect location for the director. And, and so, so there, so there used to be a commercial. <laughs> so when I lived in Los Angeles, there was a a bunch of commercials about different departments in the film industry. They had the the guy playing the piano, creating the right music. They had one for location managers. The location manager was climbing, climbing up, 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 a, up a wall. And I'm like, that's ridiculous. You can't get a company to climb up a wall. You've got to like get, you've got to have parking. You've got to have, you've got to have, I, I don't know, space. Yeah. No, I think you're right. I, um, and Samantha, I'm sure you'd agree that you know, it doesn't make any sense to find the perfect location that fits that vision of the director if if you can't get a company in to, to film it, right? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, you have to think of 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 like exactly all the logistics that Andy was saying. You you may I, I do a lot of work with um, outdoor companies, and so yeah, we may find the perfect um, vista three miles up a trail, but we're not getting a whole crew up there, so. You do have to be well aware of that stuff. And I mean, as, as far as finding the right location, like Andy was saying, you get a deck or you get um, you know, a script or something in advance. And so you have visuals to work with. You talk to the director, you talk about their vision, you send them stuff to review, and then you get feedback on that. And so that helps kind of put you in the right direction for what the look is gonna be. So that's kind of how that process goes. And then, yeah, I mean, if you're, uh, it, you don't put present locations that are going to be either impossible to get or extremely logistically difficult. You just don't even, you don't even send them in. Right. I think that's a, a really great point, a important point you made. And I, when I worked in locations, you know, where it was sort of a mantra to never show them any, don't promise them anything that you can't come through on, you know, that you don't already know is going to be a maybe at least because um, nothing worse than showing a director something they fall in love with. And it's always the one that they can't have, right? That they, yeah. that they end up loving. Um, well, or you show them something and they say, yeah, this is perfect. And you're like, all right, I'll get you something like this. True. <laughs> I mean, that's the torture. Like, <laughs> the like no, I, yeah, no yeah. This, this is what I want. Right. Um, you know, let's, let's talk about, and we don't have a lot of time before we'll probably turn it over to the audience questions, but, um, you know, let's talk, you mentioned filming in, you know, National Park Service or, you know, let's talk a little bit about that, you know, and, and you know, if you, if, if you have a commercial that is uh, looking at Utah and you're, you do a file poll and they're like, we want to film in three weeks and you know that you're going to have that. Uh, back and forth time with the director signing off on on what he or she wants. Um, do you show them public lands, um, or do you do you avoid you know certain locations because of permitting timelines? Yeah, I mean, I think permitting timelines definitely come into play. Um, and every the the funny thing about it is every public land is different. So a BLM permit in the Salt Flats is going to be turned over in a day, you know, which is 
unusual actually for public land. A BLM permit kind of in the center, central Utah, um, thinking specifically of the Richfield area, they don't have a dedicated permit person. So it takes longer. So there's just um, certain locations. I wouldn't say I wouldn't present them, but I might present them with that caveat and then talk to, or, or at least talk to the permit office in advance. Give, I almost always go in advance and say, hey, they're looking at this. Do you think this is feasible? I've honestly, they usually pull it off, even if they say they can't. It almost always does work out, but um, they well, they never say they can't. They say it could be difficult, but then they always end up doing it. So, yeah, I mean, they, yeah. They've, they've always got 30 days in their <laughs> permit requirements. Right. And well, some cities say that too, right? Yeah. yeah, I mean, everybody now, but I mean, even Salt Lake City is saying 30 days and we never have 30 days. No. So it's like, we just, we just push through and they do it in three or four days. And, and have you felt that when you do reach out to them in advance, I think that's important to, to note that, you know, when you do talk to them in advance and just kind of give them the beats of what you're trying to do, um, you know, without actually providing the map and filling out the full application, is, is, is that's helpful? I never have more than four days, so it's... it's <laughs> yeah, know. TV's a different animal. Yeah. I do have the luxury of time sometimes with these larger still productions, um, so that's helpful for me. I do, I will often reach out and just give a heads up, but yeah, on any kind of commercial jobs I'm doing, four days is usually... I usually can get an idea of what the director's liking, so then I can give some sort of, you know, maybe I'll have a week in advance to say, hey, these are our top choices. Um, how are we feeling about this or whatever? Just because um, I do find it extremely helpful. If you give them a heads up, even if you come to them with much less of a timeline, as long as they have that heads up, it, it does often help with the public land specifically. Yeah, I'm trying to get a location for Saturday. Today's Thursday. <laughs> I agree. I think it's, again, like Andy was saying, permanent timeline. There's some places that really stick to the, maybe not the full 30 days, but they want two weeks in advance that you may not have. And so you would probably either avoid them or just make a note. Again, I usually just communicate with the production. Hey, I'll try to get this, but let's have a backup or something along those lines. But um, yeah, there's definitely places that I at least have a caveat for, maybe not avoid completely. Um, for me, the biggest issue is some, sometimes what happens, you know, Salt Lake's amazing because everything's online and they're really communicative with uh, email and that stuff. There's some smaller cities that almost I've had to go in person to the office to talk to them right. and that's, it gets done, but it's uh, a lot of work for me. And so it's, um, that's something I keep in mind when I'm, when I'm sending locations into. Yeah. And, you know, one of the questions that we keep receiving is, you know, uh, what are what are the different types of permits and and agencies to contact and maybe we should elaborate on that you know because obviously there's you have a you know city county um, state and federal entities and and in some locations like uh, our lovely big and little Conway canyons right we can we can experience all four <laughs> um, if you if you're on the road and you're in the forest service and 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 you're also in a Salt Lake City watershed area. Um, what are some of your go-to sources or is it, do you feel like it's just been an experience thing that you've been able to, to know exactly like, I mean, what do you guys do when you're like, what is the permit for this location? Well, I mean, I think the Forest Service right now is the most challenging. I mean, they're the ones who have been saying no to me more often than not. And it's not because they don't wanna help, it's because they don't have the staff. Right. But otherwise, I think I think we're pretty good with all the cities and the counties and the people around us. I guess for, you know, for someone who maybe is tuning into this and they they're not as experienced as you you guys are, how how do you how do you determine which entity you need, or entities you need to contact? You, you get a map resource. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Yeah. I mean, I mean, that was one of the questions that was asked of me 20 years ago. How do I know? And I'm like, you open up a map and you look at the, <laughs> the lines. It's like, it's very straightforward. It really is, yeah. Yeah, and you can yeah. also call the, the offices, you know, when something's a little more complex, like with the watershed, 
because up in Big Cottonwood, that gets all mixed up with what Park City owns and the watershed and, you know, this and that. It is helpful to talk to as just everybody that you can and, and uh, make sure that it's not theirs and you're not stepping through bounds. But it can be complicated. Like you said, it's net forest service, it could be watershed. You could, if you're shooting on a road, then you have to get a UDOT permit. And it's, yeah, it can be complicated. And you've got to really make sure you're dotting all your I's and crossing your T's because you don't want to end up up there wherever you are and find out you missed, you know, this one private landowner who owns, you know, an acre of land up there that you're parking vehicles on or whatever it is, you know. But but every county has an assessor and you can go to the assessor's office and or do it online and you find out who owns whatever. It's it's very straightforward. Yeah, and uh, I, I remember it when I used to work under you, Andy, full disclosure, uh, a long time ago, um, the, the good old Polk, the, <laughs> the Polk guide. Do you remember the pink Polk oh, guide? Oh, yeah, we used to have those, yeah. Yeah, it was like a reverse uh, phone book that you could, you could look a, a street up by the street and then look up and it would give you all the names of addresses of all the addresses on that street. I, I, I can't so, even believe you brought that up because that's so ancient, but <laughs> we do it online now. Okay, <laughs> great, I digress. We did receive a really great question uh, from the audience. Uh, this one comes from Vika. It says, um, how would you handle the aspect of public lands being public, meaning um, you know, non-exclusive non to filmmaking? What, what are some of the steps that you guys take to to film in an area where the public can just walk through at any given time? I mean, uh, my answer to the question would just be, we're the, you know, we're kind of the face of the production. So if you just have to be really nice, I mean, you can't tell people they can't go somewhere, but typically when you're working, you know, in public lands and someone's doing something and they're in the way, you can just simply go over and say, hey, listen, do you mind? We're doing this thing. We can just, we're going to be here for however long. And I would say almost, if not all, I mean, all the time, people are very accommodating and they're like, oh, I'm so sorry. And you just try to, you, you kill them with kindness in that sense. And obviously if they say no, you have to work around it. That's my, the way I approach it. I certainly don't want to impact other people's enjoyment of the public lands, but we do try to accommodate the production when we can. Well, I'm different. I'm an angry junkyard dog. <laughs> and I just had to chase a bunch of visiting tourists off of Antelope Island because we were doing a fashion shoot. And I didn't realize how badly I was breaking the law, but <laughs> I, I, I yelled at them. I got them out of there. It, it, it was awful. And I don't think I ever want to do that again. So it is absolutely legal to take pictures on public property of whatever you can see. And I will never do that again. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm glad we got your uh, your, <laughs> uh, your confession out there on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> I would recommend to any any viewers uh, that you know take Samantha's approach. Yes, <laughs> yes. Now that was a great question. Let's talk about you know some going back into the process. So, you know, once you have you you know you have the location the, the production and the director and the producer have all signed off you what happens next what's the process besides and we talked about permitting um and you talked a little bit about it i mean what are the other things what are the other steps that you take at that point i mean you've got to do a deal <laughs> so that's the first that's the first thing once they say yes you do the deal then everything else follows from that which while we're on that topic, and you know, we had a few uh, questions about the deal, you know, about a location release form or a location um, agreement. Um, where does that come from? So it, it just comes from the production company, whatever they want to do. And I've had a few people tell me, no, I'm not going to do it. And we just had to move on. I would agree. I mean, I have, they come from the production company, typically the client, um, Occasionally, when I work on very small productions, they may ask me for one because they don't have one. Um, but most of the time, it comes from them. I've been luckier than Andy in terms of the, the clients that I've worked for. Usually, we can work around like any 
what I have the most problem with is in the production side with talent releases. Those and usage, that becomes a real issue. Locations tend to be easier uh, in terms of, of um, what they're signing off on. They tend to care a little bit less about that sort of thing. You know, what I would like to know is what's the most rewarding aspect of, of your job? What, um, what gets you out of bed in the morning and to, to be a location manager slash scout? For no, me, for me, it's getting up on the towers in Moab from a helicopter. I mean, that's, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't get better than that. That's cool. Yeah, from a scout perspective, it's certainly, um, I love going to cool places and finding new things. And I think, Andy, when you said earlier about getting the fist bump from the location, to me, that's like, I think the most satisfying experiences I've had on set where I've got a location that is nervous or maybe, you know, there's been locations in the city of, in Salt Lake that are not super film friendly. They're not stoked on it. And to get an owner to say to you, Hey, you know, you can come back here. You, you know, you, you did things that I didn't think you could do or, or whatever it is. You accommodated me in a way that no one else has, or however it goes is extremely satisfying. And also getting a location that's been hard to find. I mean, it's like, it's the hunt, right? It's the thrill of the hunt. When you, when you bag a big elk of a location that you didn't think you could get into or that's the perfect spot, it's, uh, yeah, it makes you happy. Yeah, so we broke, we broke a neighbor's window last week. Last, I mean, it was just like, he, he wanted us to be a do not, do not knock house because he was doing therapy sessions via Zoom. Oh, we no. broke his window. <laughs> and we but the filming it. crew did. We fixed it the same day. Nice. Awesome. And he was so nice about it all. But, but he, he thought it was like an invasion when we broke his window. Yeah. So to get it fixed the same day and he's back together and that, that was a big deal. Right. Well, I mean, while we have you both here, I mean, what, and, and we'll go you know, probably into the Q&A after this, but I just have one last question for you, for you guys. When you approach a, a homeowner and they've never had filming in the house, do you, do you oversell or do you undersell the impact? I would, I would imagine you make it sound worse than it would be, right? And then they're a little pleasantly surprised or- We, uh, we you know, oversell. Your, what's your this approach is, there? This is the okay. circus coming to town. <laughs> Get ready. <laughs> That's awesome. Exactly. It's better to, for them to be pleasantly surprised than the other way around. Yeah. Well, I sure have enjoyed my conversation with the two of you today. Thanks so much for taking the time. And um, I'm going to turn the rest of the time over to Sally at, with the two of you for some of the Q&A questions that we had come in. So thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, great. That was amazing. Thank you guys so much for talking with us. Uh, we'll just go ahead and get into the Q&A. So one of the first questions we have is, where do I start as a location scout or manager if I've only recently graduated from film school? Well, I mean, I think assisting is a good start for sure. Um, even if you don't have experience, I, I find if someone is really organized, really friendly, really outgoing, and uh, I, you know, I'm willing to give them shots. So I think assisting can be a really good, a good way about it. Um, but I, you know, I came from a different background. I came from still photography and kind of found, fell into it. So it can happen in many different ways, but yeah, working on a production, working on a set is probably the best start. I would agree with that. Great. Thank you. Okay. So the next question, um, which might've already kind of been answered in our discussion, but is there a database or a way to look up available locations? Well, the Utah Film Commission <laughs> has a database, and that would be a great place to start. Shameless plug for us right there. Thank yes. you. <laughs> what about you guys? Do you have your own locations on hand that you pull from? 100%. Yeah, I've got 10 years of files from, from Utah. And I mean, I love shooting, so I scout and I travel a lot. So I'm always out looking for new things and um, especially when I first moved here. And that's, that's another helpful thing maybe for people starting out. 
uh, build your database as soon as possible, you know, do it without a job, go out and go for a hike and check out some public lands and talk to friends who have cool locations and photograph them and have them on file and really just get to know the area. I think that that helps uh, tremendously to get started. Yeah, I have a tremendous database and it's completely messed up. So <laughs> <laughs> you're better off going to the film commission. <laughs> Great. And then um, just a follow-up question, do you have any tips on maintaining those relationships with those locations? In terms of um, keeping in so touch with them? Or? Yeah, so if you film at one, um, do you go back to ones you've already used? And like, how do you keep that relationship steady? Sure, I mean, you know, I'm constantly revisiting other locations depending on the different projects. And I mean, you just, keep their information on file and reach out to them as applicable. That's, yeah, I don't like keep and send them emails every once in a while or anything. It's just, you know, when a project comes up, you reach out and hopefully it works that time. Great. I, I, I think if you've done a good job at filming somewhere and when you leave, like I had a fist bump today, <laughs> It's like when you leave, they feel like you're the right person. So here, so here was the thing. I, I had my construction crew go to uh, one of my locations uh, and, and we were supposed to meet at 3 p.m. They showed up at like 2.30 p.m. and started taking measurements. The homeowner came out and said, who are you guys? And they said, we're with Andy. And he said, I don't need to know anymore. Mm -hmm. So, so that's, you just, you have a relationship with people and you make sure that you keep it consistent and constant and proper. Absolutely. Great. Yeah. I think yeah. follow-up is important too. Like I just, I was scouting yesterday and had a, a homeowner who mentioned to me like, oh, I've had a million, you know, a bunch of people come in and scout, but the job never happens. And then I never hear from them again. And he goes, but Samantha will at least always tell us that it's not chosen. So I think that's really important to just respect them and, and give them the same respect that you would want. If there are, if I mean, I think it's, it's, it's what we started with. It's about communication. hundred percent. Yeah. Always communicating. You're always available and, and people appreciate that. Yep. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so my next question is, do you need releases if a building's exterior is visible in your footage? Not legally. The Supreme Court has ruled that you don't have to do that. Great. Yeah. Um, so I think just to wrap this up, my final question would be, what's one of your favorite location stories or any fun stories you'd like to tell that have happened during your day job? Well, for me, Dead, Dead Horse Point, we put a crane out over the whole point. We were there for like a, an entire day and it was a beautiful day and I was really happy. That sounds amazing. <laughs> so I'm drawing a blank uh, in terms of like a really cool thing we did, but I did do a job, a motorcycle job out in a uh, UMC uh, several years ago and uh, got to ride on the track on the back of a motorcycle in leather. So that was, that's pretty fun. <laughs> it was terrifying and I'll never do it again, but it was also really, really fun. So not exactly a uh, production story, but first thing that came to mind. Yeah, that, yeah, that sounds like a lot of fun. <laughs> well, thank you both so much for your time. And thank you to everybody who's joined us today. Um, we appreciate it.